Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming to, to this wonderful conversation we're about to have. I am predicting the future, but I'm pretty sure I'm safe on this one, that it's going to be a terrifically interesting and informative conversation. Um, uh, this is obviously about, sadly, something I know nothing about since I've never been to Florence. I hope to remedy that now that, You're now that we're friends. <laughs> Uh, but it's a wonderful conversation. I'm going to introduce the interviewer, uh, who is a great friend of TAFAF New York, Thomas Marks, editor of Apollo Magazine, and he'll take it from there. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, Linda. Uh, and morning, everybody. Um, I, I'm sure we will, we will endeavor not to disappoint you and give you a most tedious Sunday morning of your life. Uh, but uh, Arturo is Arturo is someone who. Who, uh, who will struggle not to, not to clown around, I think, this morning. Um, let me introduce Arturo Galanzino. Uh, he is the Director General of the Fondazione Palazzo Strozzi in Florence, and has been so since 2015. Uh, we're going to be talking this morning about what this venue is, what the Palazzo Strozzi is in Florence, and about the cultural scene in Italy more generally. But to give him a little bit more uh, heft, uh, Arturo has worked in uh, France and in London, uh, having studied initially and done his doctorate in Turin. He's an art historian by training. Uh, he worked at the Louvre as an assistant curator, then at the National Gallery in London, and then really made his mark at the Royal Academy in London as, an, uh, uh, as a curator of exhibitions, where he curated exhibitions including a wonderful exhibition on Moroni, uh, portraits, and a wonderful exhibition on Giorgione as well, and other Venetian painters, um, which is why I thought it would be interesting to speak to him at TAFAF, uh, because in some senses Arturo is an art historian who started with the Renaissance, but has fast-forwarded into contemporary art, in some ways like TAFAF is doing now as well with this fair. So Arturo, without further ado, um, let me ask you if you could to just explain what is Palazzo Strozzi? When we're talking about it, what is it? First of all, morning everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Thanks Linda for the nice introduction and thanks to everybody for being here. Early morning on Sunday, so we are very brave and bold. So really we don't have to bore you uh, too much. Uh, what Palazzo Strozzi is, is a uh, private, found private public foundation. It means that the governance is mixture. We have uh, six members in our board, three are public and three are actually private. This balance in Italy is uh, quite rare. Uh, this kind of uh, mixture foundation, normally they don't work too much in our country, but so far so good for Palazzo Strozzi and we had already um, 10 years, 11 years actually of success behind us. So, so Palazzo Strozzi uh, is the building and the foundation is the organization that creates exhibitions in this 15th century palace. Yes, Palazzo Strozzi is uh, one of the landmark of uh, the Florentine uh, you know, skyline was uh, built in 1489 by the powerful Strozzi family. Actually, they were the rivals of the, the ruler Medici family. And um, the, the palace belonged to the family until uh, 1939, when it was sold uh, to the state and became uh, you know, like a public space. Uh, they put a couple of archives and library. They are still there. The very well-known Gabinetto um, Vieux uh, the uh, Institute of Renaissance, and now there is also a branch of the Normale, of the School Normale of Pisa, so it's a cultural building, let's say like that. And then there is our foundation. Uh, since the beginning, uh, since, since the 40s, the, the Palazzo Strozzi became an uh, exhibition space, but without a, a fixed rhythm, let's say like that. Uh, it so, so it was an exhibition space where occasionally the city or, or people who wanted to rent it could put on exhibitions in Florence? Yes, the, the, the Comune, the, the town hall, was organizing events there. And uh, by the way, the famous uh, Biennial of Florence was started in Palazzo Strozzi. Yeah. Now, in the last 10 years then, or 12 years since the founding of, the found, uh, of this organization, uh, what has been the, the direction? Where, where, what was it founded for? To create contemporary or historical or any exhibitions in Florence? What was the idea of the foundation there? I would say that um, at the foundation of the foundation, the first mission was to bring in Florence international events. 
you know, to bring a, a high quality cultural event, why? Um, actually, it was a, a way of fighting the mass tourism. You know, the idea was to bring in town quality tourism. And this is our, our goal and our task, you know. Um, maybe later we can talk about how our public, uh, we don't have a lot of, you know, in Italy today, tourism is becoming a problem, as you know, and uh, tourists just pass through the city, they stay a few hours, they consume the city, they don't spend quality money in town, and they just go to see the highlights, uh, such as the, in Florence, the Uffizi, the, the, the Galleria dell'Accademia, and uh, whatever. Um, in this way, uh, you know, changing, uh, rotating major show every year, twice, three times a year, uh, we can attract a higher quality tourism, that they come to Florence, because of course Florence is always Florence, and they have a good excuse to come here. And this kind of tourism is a, a, a better spender, let's say like that. Uh, you know. uh, we, we definitely come back to, to talking about quality tourism and, and what it is and whether you serve audiences in Italy or internationally. But, but for our audience, uh, it, I think it would be good to talk a little bit more about, about you as well because, uh, you know, um, to become a, a director of a major organization in Italy, uh, you became a, a director before you were 40, that's right, or maybe just on the cusp. I was 38. 38. I know I look younger, but... <laughs> um, but I was already bold. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, how did you go from... You are, you're a serious art historian. You're respected by other art historians uh, on the Renaissance. Um, you went from the RA to Palazzo Strozzi. Can, can you talk a bit about that transition and, and why it was such an appealing transition for you? And were you surprised, frankly, to, to get this job? But there is a kind of generational issue <laughs> behind this decision of moving back to Italy, because uh, in Italy, uh, being a director 38 years old is not normal. I think at 38 you are not young anymore, unfortunately. Uh, but in Italy, we were famous for that. We were yeah, famous most for... Young, most young directors in Italy are about seven. 63 or 4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it sounds promising for, for my... You know, <laughs> Yeah, more mature age, but actually it's like that, yeah. Um, so there was a, um, also a kind of desire of being back after more than 10 years uh, away to be back in my country and trying to bring back a, a certain experience that I did, try to help my country, because I think culture, uh, uh, and this is quite evident nowadays, is um, really a strategic asset for the, the future of Italy, and uh, we have to work a lot you know, make it more modern and more sustainable. And, and did your experience of working in uh, the Royal Academy, which uh, has many, many activities, the Royal Academy as a school, as a, an academy of artists, but also as, a, as an exhibition space, how did the knowledge that you got from working in somewhere, putting on so many strong temporary exhibitions, uh, help you move into the Palazzo Strozzi? For sure, RA experience was important, but also what I did in the Louvre and the, uh, the, in the NG, I, I, I used to work in major exhibition, uh, Mantegna, Titian Tintoretto Meronese in the Louvre, Leonardo in the National Gallery. So actually my life was always linked with ex exhibition. That was my destiny, unfortunately. And so I, I, you know, I put a certain experience, experience on and uh, expertise. And I, I yes, and uh, I think that um, the mentality that I found in London and in Paris uh, was useful to be export, exported in Italy. Okay, yeah. but, but yeah. you, you uh, last exhibitions that you did at the Royal Academy were on um, 16th century portraits, late 15th century, and Venetian painting. And the first exhibition you put on when you got to the Palazzo Strozzi, which is coming up on the screen at the moment, are images of Ai Weiwei. Uh, a bit of a change, no? That's the symptom of my middle age crisis, probably. <laughs> but actually, there is. I don't see too much difference, to be entirely honest, because, uh, but first of all, uh, yes, uh, as you rightly pointed out, I'm not an expert. I was not an expert of contemporary art, but, and I still am not, actually. But um, I thought since, since the beginning that uh, uh, the good move for Palazzo Strozzi was a general um, exhibition Spain doing uh, especially modern and the uh, old master exhibition. I thought that it was a good move to go in this contemporary direction because it's what was missing in Italy, uh, and it's still missing today, is a kind of a general public 
modern and contemporary art institution. And, and did yeah. you pitch it when you, when you went to your interview, at, uh, for presumably several interviews? Did you, did you say to them, yes, I'm, I'm, going to bring, uh, I'm going to bring a lot of 14th century painting, or did you say, we need to put international contemporary art in Florence? Actually, they, they, the head hunter probably they, they called me because of my record in uh, Renaissance uh, scholarship. But uh, yes, uh, at the interview, I was already very, very uh, sure that contemporary was the good the move. Uh, so probably they, they, they found me a little bit schizophrenic, but they loved me and, <laughs> and they got me, so it's okay. Yeah. And, and what were then the challenges? Uh, let's talk about that Ai Weiwei exhibition because. It was a huge, groundbreaking exhibition for Florence. 150,000 visitors in three months. Um, how, how, yeah. Yes, go for it. Yeah, 150,000 paying visitors, because this is the, the big issue. Um, in Italy, we have contemporary art, but uh, often we don't have major contemporary art exhibition able to attract uh, a real public. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it was a, a groundbreaking show for many reasons. Probably your your watching the images, uh, we were able to uh, invade the entire building for the first time, so, because Palazzo Strozzi had two different exhibition space. The basement, normally used for a uh, small contemporary art show, but uh, uh, you know, more research art show was used in the past for that, and then the first floor for all master shows. So this time we sh shake up the building using uh, as a whole, as, uh, as one, uh, and first of all, bringing contemporary art at the first floor. This was a kind of sacrilege, you know, everybody was uh, a little bit reluctant, and, but it was a great success. And then furthermore, we put on the facade this, uh, um, <laughs> he's done, uh, these uh, rough boats, and this was um, very controversial, and. Um, the installation became very famous, and I think it was a, a very good decision to do it because uh, um, for the first time we used art to say something about society. And uh, pre 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 I, I think it's important to yeah. say, um, Arturo, that mm -hmm. it's difficult to to do things, temporary installations with historic buildings in Italy, isn't it? Probably more difficult than it would be in, say, London and perhaps New York, uh, in that you have a building that is part of the national heritage, and to put life rafts in the windows of one of those buildings in Florence, th did that cause trouble? Yes, we had a lot of troubles, but we had also a lot of success. We had the squat uh, by the fascist uh, protester, the extreme right. We, we had anything. Uh, we had all these uh, old people, a little bit uh, conservative in Florence, that. Uh, they were screaming about this profanation, but at the end, uh, the result was very positive because, uh, as I told you, for the first time, contemporary art became really relevant, socially speaking, in Italy. In 2016, we were the, for the first to talk about migration, was the uh, most terrible problem Italy had and still, have, and still has uh, today, and uh, we, did it, we did it strongly, and so we, sh we show how contemporary art uh, can be uh, out of the niche, let's say like well, that. Well, that's it, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. That, that when you put life rafts, uh, this symbol of, of kind of hope, but also terror and tragedy for people crossing the seas, especially into to Sicilian islands and, and into the south of Italy, when you put them on the front of a building in Florence and people complain about them, they're sort of proving the point about, about how, how people are responding to this crisis. What was striking in the, is that we had also um, a kind of invasion, let's say like that, a peaceful invasion by many migrants. That they were, they, they, there was a tragedy in Florence uh, in January 2017 at the very end of the show. There was a fire and many of them died. Um, actually, they used Palazzo Strozzi as a place to, to spread their voice to protest, uh, to speak with, with politicians, and I was the filter between their protest and the, let's say, official world, you know? I think this was really the first time that really an exhibition had an echo uh, uh, on real human tragedies. And then doing that, um, I think in Florence has even more sense, because uh, what we do with our contemporary installation, uh, what we, uh, you are seeing in the screen, is using um, Florence not as a neutral space, we use our heritage, not, not, not as a weight, as a burden, but as a strength. 
to put this raft uh, on the symbol of humanism, so the symbol of the hum humanist values leading Europe, uh, leading our politician and our, uh, you know, uh, everything we believe in, had a, a very strong sense. It's not like just putting something like that randomly. One of, one of the exhibitions that has been also hugely successful and, and that has really done that and done something that only only you could do at that, at that venue was your Bill Viola exhibition. Bill Viola uh, is exhibited all around the world, but Palazzo Strozzi is probably the only place where you could have put on an exhibition of Bill Viola adjacent to the Renaissance and Mannerist paintings that had inspired so many of his works. How, how did that come about? Yeah, Bill was for the first time he accepted to do that. Uh, he accepted in Florence because he uh, started his career in Florence. It's not some, something so common, not everybody knows it. He started his career in Florence and he was shocked when he was 20, 22, 23 years old, he's old by the Renaissance. He was a, a guy coming from the Queens and uh, he didn't know anything about Old Master and he was shocked about what he found in town. Um, so Florence became his uh, special city, you know, his, uh, and... Um, was there when, in the late 60s? Late, late 68, 70, in, in, in the half the of 70s, yeah, exactly, after the flood. At the time, Florence was still a kind of, uh, there was still a kind of contemporary scene, very small, but uh, international. And so what we do was uh, very philological, because we put the videos bill close uh, to the um, real masterpiece that at the time influenced him. So this was really philological, is, is the memory of the video. And so we do this uh, kind of clash. Uh, with, so for example, well. you, you've had things which hadn't been exhibited. There were things from churches that were restored for the exhibition, is that right? Or that you were able to remove on loan and, and put in your exhibition spaces? We, of course, we did. Uh, we did restoration. We, we also we always work uh, um, giving because we don't have a collection nowadays. It's mo more and more common to do this kind of cow trading. You know, I give you a painting, and uh, you will lend me something for the next show. This is normal. Uh, we don't have a collection, so of course I have a beautiful smile, but that is does <laughs> is not enough. So uh, normally we try to give in exchange restoration, but. I can say that um, always the, the strong uh, scholarship that there is behind our project um, is enough for getting the loans. But sometimes, especially working with our local heritage, we want to uh, give back and give back with restoration. We did it especially for the Cinquecento show that finished a few months ago, where we restored uh, for more than 350,000 euro in Florence and Tuscany. So this was amazing. And all this money was, of course, private. Uh, so we well, did something really for the state question. that, yes. yeah. I mean, that, that is my next question, because you, you, you sort of uh, jokingly say, yeah, I, I can smile and, and, and get the Met to loan me 10 paintings, but uh, it's not as easy as that, is it? And, and you are a, a Kunsthal, essentially, without a, a collection. So what is, where is the money coming from? Where, where, how does Palazzo Strozzi, when there, so much money is needed to keep the heritage, the collections alive, well, where does yours come from? Yeah, my, actually, my money um, changes every year, but let's say that uh, on an average scale, uh, we are a very sustain, sustainable institution. Why? Because only 20% of our money comes from the state. I mean, from the region and from the town hall. The, the rest of this 80% is split between tickets, about 40, 45% sometimes, and private fundraising, private money. Mm -hmm. So we are, um, as you can imagine, very, very sustainable. And this is even more striking if you think that in Italy, we don't have a system like you have in US. Uh, two days ago, you were here with uh, these important colleagues from uh, American institution. They can uh, fundraise privately 100% almost of their, of their budget. But in America, there is a certain system helping this. In Italy, it's not so easy. In Italy, it's not so easy, especially for an institution like my institution. Because um, for state museum, now there is a, a structure allowing them to fundraise. For me, it's more difficult. That's, that's why you have an American friend of Palazzo Strozzi. 
Yeah, I do, yes, we have uh, an American <laughs> friend of Pazzo Strozzi, but actually what we do in New York is more linked with the charitable, the charitable uh, action, especially we work with the disadvantaged children from New York, Detroit, and LA, and we try to teach them the Renaissance value, so what we do is like a kind of fellowship, and we bring them, 40 of them every year, in Italy uh, to study and to see with their own eyes uh, what the Renaissance means. Um, in terms of the sort of next question from, from that idea of, of the funding, you then have total operating independence, or who, who do you feel like you're answerable to, your public or, or your funders? Yeah, of course, to, to, my, to my board, which, as I told you, are um, formed by three public members and three, and three private. Yes, of course, um, the, the political part is, um, is important, and I can say that in Italy, um, when I came back in Italy, I found in Florence, um, you know, people with really open mind. And uh, I can say Palazzo Strozzi is completely free to do what, what he wants so far. So I, I can tell you that freedom is, uh, is uh, probably the best asset we have. I can do whatever I want. So, so I think uh, people will hear, you will have seen some of the images coming. We've, we've put them on a loop so you get a sense of the exhibitions, uh, the viola, and you will have seen as well the, the current uh, installation, uh, which is this Karsten Hurler slides, uh, double helixes intertwined through the courtyard of the Palazzo Strozzi. I'm really interested that you say you're free to do what you want because it strikes me that, that, that something like that might be, might be quite difficult to put on in, in Florence with its quite strict regulations about architectural interventions. Yeah, basically, uh, what we do is to invite the you know, leading international artists because, as, as you can understand, if I have to do 80% um, of my budget with my own strength, of course, I need to have a successful show. I can talk to the niche. I have to talk to a, to a big public because uh, tickets can be 40, 45% of my budget. So it's very important that I try to, to be experimental, of course, but I always want to have uh, a certain uh, success. I, I had to, uh, unfortunately. Um, uh, this is special. This big fresco with uh, Bill Viola. This was a, magic, a magical moment of the Bill Viola show. I'm no, sorry. Now, about Castaneda. So I invited him uh, to do something at Palazzo Strozzi. We start uh, this conversation. Of course, he's famous for being uh, the artist of the slides, uh, something that he doesn't like too much, actually, because uh, it's not only that. Um, and again, we start talking about our starting point, which is Florence, our history, our heritage, uh, like we did with the other artists. And so basically, um, what, strike, um, what strikes me and, and, uh, and Carsten was that the Florence, um, in Florence we had this couple, uh, art and science, that always been together until uh, the Enlightenment, let's say like that. And so, um, you know, think about Leonardo da Vinci, think about the generation of Brunelleschi and uh, Leon, Leon Battista Alberti. So we started from this starting point to put together again art and science. So let's do the Florence experiment. So let's involve a real scientist, uh, really, uh, who is a pioneer because uh, Stefano Mancuso, the professor working with us, is really a pioneer in the science because he invented the neuroscience, vegetal neuroscience. So basically, he studies the intelligence of the plants. Uh -huh. It sounds crazy, but actually, it's, it's, there, it's, a, it's very revolutionary. And um, I had a very clever salad last night. <laughs> yeah, actually, beans are incredibly intelligent. Beans are very beans intelligent. Are, and that's the reason why we use these beans uh, to be part of the experiment, as you will see. Um, so we created these two, these two big slides, and this is the beginning of the experiment. You go down with your bean plant, then after, at the end of the slide, you go down to the basement where we set up a real laboratory and you give to the scientists, we are real scientists working there, the bean plant, and they start analyzing, analyzing this plant. And uh, <coughs> actually the um, photosynthetic parameters change after this uh, experience because the plant apparently feels your emotion. Okay? This is the first part of the, uh, all these results will be published uh, in a few months in a scientific magazine. So everything is very serious, everything is very well done. Sounds crazy, I know, but it is, it is like that. What, what emotion uh, do you have going down the slide? There are two emotions, actually, fear and joy. And this is the second part of, this is the second part of the experiment. When you give your plant to the scientist, uh, you have uh, two rooms with two 
a crystal box. It looks like traps, actually. But they're crystal box, and they are two cinemas. In one cinema, you have a horror movie. In the other one, you have a funny movie, comic, comedy, etc. You will see these two boxes are linked to the facade of Palazzo Strozzi with, a, with, an, incredible, with an incredible system of pipes and pumps. <coughs> And we, we are sucking the air of these two boxes and spreading the air to the facade with two different pipes. So what's happened? That on the facade there are eight wisteria growing and the growth of these plants will be influenced by the air produced by the, the men and the women, the visitors, uh, of the fear and the air of joy. And we will see on the facade how the plants will react. So the facade of Palazzo Strozzi became uh, nowadays, a uh, living sculpture, like a kind of scientific vegetal graphic about the relation between men and plants. This is very fun, is incredible. To me, of course, was to give a message of ecology, because this is... I mean, that, that is partly it. Is, yeah. uh, for me, there is something a bit satirical yeah. about it as well. You this know. is the intelligent bean. This yeah. is the clever bean. He <laughs> looks, looks, looks very smart, yeah. Is that that's the most clever one that you've got in the in the storeroom? Yeah, they are all over. This, look how many they are. Yeah, this is a class. You see, a full class. <laughs> a school yeah. of beans, yeah, school, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, how, what has the reaction been like to, to this? Uh, people taking it seriously? I mean, I, I see that the serious message is is exactly that: how we interact with the world around us, rather than, from my perspective, how a plant thinks or doesn't think, but uh, how we think about our relationship to even these individual details in, in nature. Yeah, it, it, yes, the, the, the idea is just to um, open the mind of our visitors to another dimension. Uh, plants today are very important. Medicine are done with plants. Energy is done with plants. We, br we breathe because of the plants, you know. But, you know, we don't respect too much uh, our environment. So, f first of all, was this idea of putting together in relation human and plants was important then you have to do this adventure and you do it with your plant and you have to take care of this uh, very weak and fragile being uh, so this is something that i think is um, you know enhance your uh, sense you know your yes and um, yes yeah, so you said the reaction every everybody was was uh, uh, shocked about these two slides because they are very spectacular. Karsten himself says that they are the most beautiful slides ever done. And because to do that in a 15th century palace is... Yeah. is uh, but that's the thing, isn't uh, it? The helixes still play in to the architecture of, yeah. of, of 16th and, and late 15th century Florence. And in fact, those uh, garlands going up the wall, to me they look in the images like something out of a Ghirlandaio fresco. For so sure. it, it's not as if they're foreign entirely to Florence. Then Karsten always works with this symmetry, a double choice, uh, you know, the, the, the mirror, the, you know. Palazzo Strozzi is perfectly symmetric. And the Strozzina, so the basement where we have this laboratory, is perfectly done uh, to have this double choice because there is two slides, to, to, to path, to choices. It looked perfect for him. But so it looks that it was done for Karsten Höller. I, I'm interested, you've had uh, Ai Weiwei, you've had uh, Bill Viola, now Karsten Höller. You're going to be working with Marina Abramovic uh, later this year. Uh, and she had, uh, has quite close links historically to, to, to Italy, her famous um, works in the gallery in Naples, uh, which really made her name. But, but this is a quite a, an international contemporary art. Uh, is, is that really important to you? Or would there be a version of Italian contemporary art that could work in Palazzo Strozzi? We now have currently going on this uh, Italian modern art show, this Nascita um, della Nazione, this show about uh, uh, Italian modern art in the 60s, basically, which was a, a first step to uh, enhance the reputation internationally of, uh, of um, Italian modern art. As you know, um, the market and collectors were the first to understand the importance of our national modern artists. Uh, and that's the reason why they are much more collected abroad or privately than in our, in our institution. So again, we try to uh, also to, to do something around uh, Italian art for sure. And maybe in the future we could do something even more contemporary with Italian artists for sure, yeah. And, and who would be, I mean, what more generally, uh, sure, Arte Povera and, and Fontana and those circles, um, 
uh, even the painters now of you know Dorazio and, and, and Griffa, not necessarily linked to each other. These are people getting international shows, uh, but more or less towards the end of their lives. I, is there a version? How strong is the art scene for contemporary artists I, in Italy at the moment? Probably not the the best person to talk about it because I, I I'm not the, I'm not running a um, contemporary museum, a national contemporary museum with a collection, etc. But I can say that probably in in Italy we don't have a system allowing uh, the artists to to work. Many of them, as you know, they they have to live. Uh, they can't live in Italy. Uh, there is no many commissions, residence, etc. You know, and the market is quite soft, perhaps for yeah. for those emerging yeah, artists. Yeah. I, I think this is a little bit the, the problem. This is the reason why uh, we have all over the world the Italian sales, uh, you know, uh, dedicated to the uh, Italian art uh, until the 70s, uh, sometimes 80s. But we do not we don't have anything internationally renowned afterwards just few names as you know maybe Catalan, vanessa beecroft i don't know who are the the biggest italian names nowadays yes probably um yeah vanessa beecroft who doesn't even sound like an italian name no but she's yeah and we did something with her uh, last september now i think we have to in italy we have to create a system uh, able to allow these artists to work to live and to sustain their activity and their lives and do, do you think the Strozzi could be part of that system? I would really like, but uh, so far I, with these balances, because I have to sustain myself and to, uh, you know, to pay my, my program, I reinvest uh, my money, then, then, you know, so if I do something more, I reinvest for the next year. So, so far I can't do uh, really something like that because we, this will not be rentable, but maybe uh, I, can found, I can find an additional sponsor and to do, something more, to do something like that more sustainable. Yes, this is something I can do in the past, but so far I didn't plan to do anything like that. The other thing I thought was very interesting, you started talking uh, about um, audiences and about uh, tourism in Florence. Uh, Florence, uh, you know, it's chock a block. It's so busy. Not as busy as Venice at the moment and the problems faced there. But tourism that is quite temporary, that is in and out on big coach parties, that erodes perhaps the integrity of the city and, and its buildings to some degree. I mean, the other side of the coin is that there's access to as many people as possible to these things and that some kind of access to the historical art is vital because of even that that one encounter could teach somebody about about the values of of art and and and, and the renaissance and humanism so how at the strozzi are you balancing that what, what is your audience how much is it a place for florentines how much is it for italians and how much is it for tourists from abroad yeah, but of course it depends on our program. It can change a lot. I just have written down some last figures of 2016. We are going to publish 2017 report next week, so I still have old date, old data, but it doesn't change too much actually. Um, about tourism, we have uh, we had in 16 41 percent of tourism. Of to in tourism, tourist means people sleeping at least one night in Florence. This is a tourist. Then there is the excursionista. I don't know. What yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Excursionist, I'm sure that will the work. Excursionist, it means day that tripper day the tripper. Day tripper, and of course day tripper are often Italian. Um, 26%, so basically 41 plus 26 is 66, uh, almost 70% of our public is not Tuscan. So only 30% is Tuscan. So it's quite, a, it's quite a good, I think, a good balance. But what is important to say is that about these excursionists or, or, uh, and tourists, these are not the mass tourism. Because then we do, 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 we do surveys, or only a small part of them are part of this mass dangerous tourism. Because at the end of the show, um, everybody's invited to do these kind of surveys, especially uh, the tourists. And uh, so we study their behavior. And um, it's like that. Our public is a quality public. So this is important for us. Why? Because this uh, 41 plus 26 percent creates in Florence a good economy. How much these people spend, they spend in Florence. They buy, they go to restaurants, they, they, sp they, sp they spend in Strozzi, they spend uh, in the hotel. And we work with some uh, consultants, such as uh, Boston Consulting Group, 
And um, with their system of calculation, they uh, figure out that every year uh, Palazzo Strozzi brings uh, to the local economy uh, seven, eight times um, its budget. So we are talking about something be around 50 million uh, every year that we create. 50 million of good, sustainable economy. Now, that, that has always been the case more generally with Italy's um, heritage and with its art museums and galleries uh, and indeed the art that is just there in monuments and, and churches. There's been a lot of reform in, in the Italian museum system in the last five years. Uh, the culture minister that was, but now has um, lost his seat in, in the recent election, Dario Franceschini, uh, had open competitions for a number of new directors of major museums. A lot of museums where there were three or four were consolidated with solitary directors. For instance, in Florence, the Palazzo Pitti and the Uffizi came together as one larger institution. Uh, the archaeological park in Rome has become one major institution with the Colosseum and the Forum and the Palatine. H how, how well is all of that working? I mean, you're a bit outside that. Do you think that it's been a successful reform? Yes, I am completely outside of this reform because, as I, as I said at the beginning, we are a private foundation. Um, but, of course, we work closely with, uh, with the, our colleagues in the state museums and uh, this uh, reform, um, this reform was, was also very important for us, uh, that's for sure. But what can I say? Um, this was a, um, properly a revolution. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, our heritage, culture, and the art system is really very important for our next development, is a strategic asset for our economy. And I think it, we have to give the credit to the, the previous government to to bet on this uh, strongly. Uh, Franceschini, I think, was the, uh, the Minister of Culture who had uh, the bigger power so far because they really changed the, the structure, had a lot of money to spend, and for the first time the, the figures were increasing instead of going down. Yeah, I mean, I think what's so interesting is that, um, to, to, to probably simplify a little bit, but those museums for the first time were given independent operating budgets. The revenue they were making, they were able to put back into projects on the whole. Whereas in the past, everything was centralized and then redistributed. I mean, have you seen in the museums, in Naples, in Rome, the museums with the new directors, in Venice as well? I mean, after all, 20 or so people were just chucked out of their jobs. The, the current directors and new people were instated. It was a very draconian measure in some senses. Has the quality of those museums, the fact that uh, the exhibitions, the quality of the buildings, can you see it improving? I saw many improvement. Uh, it's probably easier to work in, um, in uh, cities where there is a lot of public because uh, uh, not uh, all the cities where um, the state museum are, they, they can... Uh, have all this tourism and these people, you know, passing through institutions. But in any case, the numbers are higher, increased. Uh, there were uh, some interesting um, initiatives, such as the Free Sundays, so you know, to invite people to go to the museum. I think we, what we had, we have to do in Italy is, of course, to attract tourism, but also to make the museum more accessible to everybody, especially to the Italian, because uh, we have to make it a living space. Before it was not uh, entirely like that. Uh, this was a proper, a proper revolution and it, it will take a lot of time to, 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 to do it, so three, four years are, are not enough, of course. So let's see what's, what's happening in the future, but um, the first uh, results are uh, encouraging uh, under many points of view. Many museums are now, are now more efficient, etc in terms of I mean, restoration. It's, it, it's, been, it's caused all sorts of intriguing uh, anecdotal stories. Um, you know, I think it was your colleague in one of the places in, in uh, the Campania who, who, who his staff complained he was working too hard. Uh, and there was now, now there's a problem in, in the Borghese, which is slightly different, but where the director has been suspended for going to the gym too much. Uh, so it, it's still, uh, uh, you know, museums are in the public eye in Italy, perhaps more than they were before. The, the director of the Borghese, she's a friend, she's very fit, so probably, yeah. <laughs> but, so, 
so she, she doesn't need to go to the gym. No, I'm joking. Now, uh, what I can say, this is, uh, I don't have a lot of information about this, uh, this case, uh, but um, I, can say, I can tell you that I, I, I think this was before the, the, the reform, so it was uh, something that started before this new system, but of course I think that a museum director uh, of an important museum such as the Borghese, they don't have uh, you know normal uh, hours of work. Um, a director works 24 hours a day, so probably there is uh, no, on yeah. a Sunday morning. <laughs> no, this is fun for me, but no, it's true. But you have to work on Sunday morning very, very, very often. So I think that uh, um, all these museum directors they work much more than uh, what they are supposed to do, and especially at the beginning of this new restructuring process, so of it's course. It's a, a teething process, a process yeah. of, of, of re adapting. Yeah. In terms of your own revolution, before I open the floor to some questions perhaps, um, obviously uh, Marina Abramovich is coming and this is a really exciting show, but, but perhaps can you, can you give us an idea, even in, a, in an ideal world, who might be some of the other leading contemporary artists that you would like to bring to Palazzo Strozzi? No, I will not tell you, but for... But, uh, but, but I will tell you that um, uh, after Marina, uh, we go back to the future, let's say like that, and um, we have a major show on Verrocchio, so the master of Leonardo da Vinci, and I'm very excited about this show because uh, it's the first show on Verrocchio, and uh, I'm sure it will be very interesting. So I'm happy to do this balance between contemporary, modern, and old master. Um, for strategically, strategical reasons and for um, other reasons, we, we are now, you know, pushing more the button of contemporary art, but all masters are still very, very important for us. And sometimes you found out that they are very, very modern as well. Well, sometimes they're very contemporary. So I'm going to stop that part of the conversation and see whether there's anyone in the audience who, who would like to ask Arturo a question or comment. Yes, there's a lady there. That your revenues like 17 times higher than budget, or I didn't understand. I said that, that the economical impact of an institution like Palazzo Strozzi, yes, is more or less seven times of uh, its own budget. That's what the money that so, is brought or spent in the city. In I'm not your, uh, an eco uh, what's included in your revenues? Uh, the ticket price, the stores. Uh, I, I mean the economical impact on the community, on the on the on the Tuscany, you know, on the region. You know what I mean? So an institution like my institution with its own budget around six, seven, eight million, depends on the year, uh, has an economical impact of seven times more on the local economy. Why? Because these people coming, because of course there is the money we spend, the money and the the economical system that we create, of course, but there is especially the money spent by people coming for Palazzo Strozzi. So this survey, uh, these people, they answer, I came to Florence for this exhibition. So it means that they are exclusivist. So the money they spent was especially spent because of my institution. Of your museum. And uh, another question is, how many people are coming uh, annually to like last year, for example? Yeah, um, last year was 360,000. Yeah, we only have two show a year, you know, so it's, uh, the average is very high, yeah. Thank you. But There's a question the, here. In but the I can tell you that through the courtyard, because the palace, is, of course we have two show a year, but the palace is always open. Uh, through the courtyard we have more than one million people passing through, and we, the good thing of open Palazzo Strozzi uh, with the foundation Palazzo Strozzi was to give back this courtyard as a public space. Because it's connected it's in the real center of Florence, it's connecting Via Tornabuoni to Piazza Strozzi, so it's a, um, a strategic uh, place, in, yes, place of the city, and um, it's, a, it's important to have this, this passage and to have it as a living space. Well, yeah. well you, you've got a big slide in there at the moment. Yes. <laughs> Can't walk through it at all. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, uh. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, um, in your conversation, you spoke about the role of the system in Italy, where you mentioned the fact that the system is not helpful for young or cont very contemporary artists. 
My question is, Palazzo Strozzi is a very, very important institution and is doing beautiful and extremely exciting shows, uh, calling great artists from abroad. But because of that, because of your role in the city of Florence and your role in the art world in Italy, don't you think that you could start thinking about introducing uh, with the help of galleries, Italian galleries do not support so much the young contemporary Italian artists. But couldn't you become a leader of a movement, for instance, where you call in the people from Pastificio Cerro in Rome, where there are many, many artists, contemporary artists, which, who are quite good. Don't you think that you could be sort of the steering wheel of a process of, you know, uh, showing more to the world the contemporary Italian artists, like they do in America. I mean, the American system is fantastic, but we all know the money here is very different from what there is in Italy. The fiscal system helps, but people like you could be, uh, could be very important for this. Thanks for the, the question. It is more a tip and, <laughs> and an invitation than a question. Yes, I, I, I will consider what, what, what you say, but as a director of an institution like that, I, I was hired, of course, to bring uh, important cultural um, events in town and um, also to, uh, to do something for um, our cultural system, artistic system, for sure. But unfortunately, at the end of the year, I will always have to think about uh, the balance because uh, we are a private foundation, we need to always to be uh, sustainable, etc. And working in this sense uh, is probably not our mission so far. Uh, as I said before, talking with Mark, uh, probably we should uh, find a different uh, system to do that, uh, a specific sponsorship for doing that. But at the same time, I can tell you, there are, it's true, we are the most attended exhibition space in Italy, talking about the average of our exhibition, and uh, we are probably one of the institutions in Italy with the best, the, the, the better press and uh, criticism, etc. but it's true. Uh, we are prestigious in a way, but there is contemporary art museum that they should do that. What do you think, C.G. Fredo, no? Yeah. So probably well, it's more I, something that... <laughs> yeah, but right. I think it's interesting, I mean, at the moment, the Dawn of a Nation exhibition, uh, which is showing artists you know, from uh, Fabro, Cunelis, uh, you don't have later on through Spalletti and so on, but, but these are artists now who have, have been taken up by some of the big blue chip galleries and, and whether there is a possibility to think about, hang on, we are, we are processing and, and thinking about the research and the art history here. Maybe it is time that, that now that the market has flown so high for Italian post-war art, you could be a place to to come back and and bring some of some of their their resources back to help you and help younger artists. Oh yeah, let's see. In Italy, uh, as I said, there are uh, national uh, modern contemporary institutions that they should should work on our own uh, artists, and uh, so probably I repeat, it's still uh, up to them. And uh, then I have to uh, think about my mission, that is to bring um, a certain variety of events. I think that an institution like Palazzo Strozzi uh, um, has a special identity that is to change its skin twice a year. So if we stuck just on one topic, uh, one you know field of research, I think uh, that we will change our uh, our uh, mission, our identity. I, uh, to be honest, I don't like it. I prefer to be a more a kaleidoscopic institution, able to to have the best uh, events in Italy with contemporary, modern, and old master. This is uh, what is written. <laughs> is one more question at all. Uh, on the commercial, uh, well, there's a rise of, in, of commercial uh, galleries, and it was now the uh, Milan Art Fair, uh, which did really well in Italy, so just a couple of words, I guess, on how that might change the sort of future of, of Italian sort of cultural um, activity. There, there's more money flowing into to Italy now because of this. In Naples, there's a couple of big international galleries that have started opening up. 
Yeah, there is a nice process in this, in this sense. We have uh, more uh, fairs, and the uh, existing fairs are getting more and more important. It's true there is uh, more interest in the Italian modern art, um, in terms of Colletti, etc. So I think we are living, uh, and many galleries are moving, as you rightly said, uh, to Italy. Also in terms of um, you know, public mentality, there is uh, more interest in having modern contemporary art. So I think it's a very uh, positive trend that we have in Italy. So yes, you're, you're right, and tell me. Let, let's end on a positive note. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> it's very rare, so thank but you this very time, much yeah. To, to Arturo Galanzino uh, yeah, for joining me this morning. Thank you all again for coming. Please remember there are two more coffee talks uh, tomorrow morning and Tuesday, both very interesting. You can check the board uh, outside this room at 11 a.m. Tomorrow at 4 is uh, about passion collecting or passionate collecting. I can't remember. So that's going to be very interesting at 4 p.m. in this space. Thank you. This has been a fascinating conversation. It's a real asset to have you here as part of our program. Um, I think you can all agree to that. So please come back anytime. Okay. Okay. Thank you all so much.